welcome back to another recap video. This is day four in Porto, Portugal. In this round four, I played against my third Portuguese player in a row. So in honor of that, we have a classic Portuguese snack trying out the Portuguese snack segment. Rev, you understand me? Mm. That's some good chocolate. In round four, I'm playing a Port another zero rated player for the second round in a row. And as I said yesterday, these are wild card games. I really don't know what comes out of this, how good they are online, how good they measure up uh, in classical chess. But one thing is for sure, it's their first FIDE rated tournament. So maybe they have Portuguese tournaments, but this is their first FIDE rated tournament. My opponent comes to the board and he's a bit sh shaking, not shaking, shaking, but he looks nervous. Maybe because I was streaming the event and I have a camera on him. Maybe because of the stage lights directly pointed at him. Or maybe because he was on the stage right up uh, next to the audience. I don't know. When I got to the board, I sensed some uncomfortableness. And during the game, he let off a lot of cues that he was uncomfortable with his position, which ultimately gave me a psychological hand. We start off. My opponent has the white pieces, I have the black pieces. e4, I go e5, knight f3, I go knight c6, and we're going into an Italian with bishop c4. I haven't played this move in maybe over two years on chess.com, and if I have played it, it was a really rare moment, and that is bishop c5. If you follow my games, my live games very, very closely, let's say on Twitch, you know that in Blitz I always go bishop e7, and this is called the Hungarian defense. I go bishop c5 and yeah, avoid all preparation against my online chess games, which is kind of a smart move here. And so this led off for a really nice game because c3, knight f6, and then you can see that I'm just very confident in my, in my prep. So my opponent goes bishop g5, which the wind agrees is too fast. Bishop g5 pins my knight, but you usually wanna go with this move after I castle. So I can kick the bishop here with h6, but because I haven't castled, there is no king in jeopardy when I play g5. And so g5, once again, strikes at this bishop. Something like knight takes g5 doesn't work at all because takes, bishop takes, and although this is a pin, I have bishop takes f2 that I calculated, which is really nice. When the king takes, I just have like knight g4, oh, knight g4, queen takes, wait, wait, wait. I had knight takes e4, I had knight takes e4 check, okay. So knight takes e4 check, takes and then there's a discovered attack on this bishop and here I'm up some material and the king is terribly placed. They go bishop g3, so that's good. Now I go bishop a7. By putting my bishop on a7, essentially kicking it away in advance, this is called a prophylaxis move in chess. Here I'm preventing tempo moves such as d4, attacking my bishop and striking for the center. So now d4 can still be played but it's minus the attack on my bishop. But mainly, here I can't go knight a5, okay? Knight a5 would quote unquote win the bishop pair, except for one move, and that is b4, forking both of my pieces. And here, if I, do, if I don't take this, I lose a piece. But if I do, then they don't take back my knight, but they take back my bishop on c5. So by getting my bishop back, I'm threatening once again knight a5, but you don't have the, the resource b4 because I just take and I win a pawn on e4. So b4 was played anyways and so now I go knight h5. Knight h5 aims to win the bishop pair with knight takes g3 or aims to go knight f4 and, you know, claim the bishop pair because bishop takes looks like a pretty quote-unquote forcing move, right? And after a 20 minute move, 24 minute move actually, knight takes e5 is played here. Is this good for white? Is this good for black? We don't know. There's a huge mystery here. Because now, the queen is attacking this knight. So I can't just like take back this knight and queen takes. I'm down a full pawn. And black are threatening this with mate. So it's very dangerous, right? So here, I have to have calculated knight takes g3, the intermediate move uh, that lands us into a huge desperado. So a desperado is when your piece is attacked and it's desperate to not lose itself. So it does another attacking move. But yeah, that's basically what's happening here. And so, although my opponent is threatening a fork on both of my queen and rook, 
and they're threatening bishop takes f7 with check, and they're threatening knight takes e6 attacking my queen, I am still pulling rank here with this knight on g3 and some resources that come along. But I have to calculate this all before knight h5. Knight takes c6 is the first thing I calculate before playing knight h5. Luckily, I found queen f6 that threatens checkmate combinating with my beautiful bishop on a7, which we called, right? We said this bishop would be utile on this diagonal. It's very pretty here. White has a couple moves, but essentially, if you take my bishop, which releases the mating threat, knight takes h1, and I'm threatening checkmate on f2, newly due to this knight landing on h1. And now this forces a defensive response out of white to defend this f2 square. So like, let's say knight d2. Now I take a piece on a7. And here we're up a full rook, second line I had to see. The forking line, knight f7, attacking my queen and rook. I have to see once again the saving queen f6, threatening checkmate. It's very interesting here because black is essentially nothing. If you go queen d2 to defend, Knight takes h1, knight takes h8, and now I can just take this knight here and be up a full piece. And my knight, this is the key, my knight is not trapped. Because I'm attacking f2, and let's say you go like d4. Now I can take on d4, sacrifice my knight, c takes, and bishop takes d4, and now your rook is trapped. So you cannot break the liaison between my bishop and knight. There's a grasshopper on my screen right now. Variation three is what they played. Bishop takes f7, check. This forces a king response, and I go king f8. And here after knight g6, I can just take this bishop, knight takes, queen takes, and then queen f3. But this is a better move. Okay. okay, so here you can take with the pawn, which is very nice. I like white here because they're coming in with like rook f1, queen f3, or even queen, e5, queen h5 check. But here my opponent plays queen f3 to try to win my knight cleanly and still open up castling options. Because if you take here with the pawn, my bishop strikes on g1 and you can't castle short at least. So queen f3 check. And here best was king e7 with just really quick development after, like bishop e, e6, rook f8, and then my pieces are extremely active and, and positive on the board. I even was very close to playing king g6, which is very interesting because after queen takes, my king is oddly safe because of this complementary bishop, and white can never make strides for attack. So let's say h4 to attack this and threaten to take this on this pin, I would have g4, and then on f3 I would have h5, and this would be completely locked in, and white has zero counterplay. So queen f3, knight f5 is what I played finally. Takes, and then I take here on b4. And then after king d2, my only blunder of the game, c6. Why is this a blunder? Because I missed rook e1, a tyrannical move, taking up all of the e-file. Pro bono, giving you the e-file, my kind sir friend. And this, involved with queen h5, can be very, very dis displeasing, right? So, my opponent played queen h5, though this is winning for black. Um, because here, I, I found the only resource with the black pieces, which was really cool. King f8, and on, this is all forced, by the way. Rook e1, threatening rook e8 threatening queen g6. It's really troubling if I don't find anything here, and I have to find this huge blundering looking move, which is actually the best move in this position. Bishop takes f5, advantage for the black pieces. Why? Because after queen f5, which pins my bishop and wins a piece, I have queen f6, g4, still winning a piece, but after all of this, I have the coup de grace of the game, knight takes d3. And here I'm attacking this rook and that's the only piece that really matters. That's the only thing that matters. Not even taking the pawn here. This matters. And okay, let's run you through this. If the bishop is taken, I take the rook and then you take my knight and it's exactly equal though all your pawns are bad. That happened in the game. If you move the rook, let's say rook e2, here I have knight f4. Knight f4 attacking the rook. Again, 
and liberating myself from the pin. So if you move the rook again, I can just move my bishop and look at this terrific position, it's over. Even I would consider going here to go queen g6 and then absolutely devastate, right? So rook e2 is not possible. On rook e3, you just drop a rook. And let's say you go like rook e4 for the memes. I could just go d5 here and once again attack your rook. And let's say like rook a4, I could just... Uh, take here and have sufficient compensation with the black pieces. I like rook e8 here and the engine gives minus six. It's looking very nice, very nice indeed. And so finally, uh, the person in charge of the streamers at the tournament mentioned to me this line, rook f1 for the white pieces, which is actually quite interesting. I have nothing to save this bishop here, but black is still completely winning if they find knight f4, giving this and then just d5 and black are just gonna absolutely tear apart the white pieces even though I'm down the exchange in this position. So really, really awesome. Knight takes d3, my opponent crumbles under pressure. Queen takes f5 was played and we go into this endgame. This is a pawn up, though it is completely winning for the white pieces because although I'm only a pawn up, my two pieces are extremely active in two moves. Okay, there's a little caveat there. My pieces are not necessarily active now. This bishop is, but this rook is absolutely not. But it will be in a couple moves. Magically, you'll see. Uh, but most likely, this is the main reason why black is completely winning here. These pawns are all isolated pawns, which means they cannot be defended by other pawns and this makes for four pawn islands. So when I attack, let's say a pawn on f5, you need to defend it with a, with a knight, rook, and or king. And added to the fact that all of these pieces are on the back rank and are very far from this pawn, this is my first target. Not the c3 pawn, not the a2 pawn, because these are on closed files. So it's really hard for my rook or even bishop to attack them. So of course you bring your rook into the attack and you check the king so you gain tempo and attack the first weaknesses, the first weakness that's the most overextended towards you. And so I win this f5 pawn. You can't play f6 really because I just go here and I win this pawn instead and then the f6 pawn completely winning for black. So then knight d2 he gives the pawn and f3. This is a weak pawn that's defended by a knight. How do we correct this? Bishop e3. You attack the weakness or you try to remove the guard from the weakness here. Knight c4 is an option, but I just have bishop f4 and then like d5 is coming in. This is devastating. The knight would have to like take refuge on this side of the board and essentially just like completely slowly winning for black. My opponent goes knight e4, which okay, I can take here on f3 and take here on h3, but then I give d6 and then with the attack of b7. So instead, I wanted to go d5 first, knight here, and then give actually b7. But my opponent saved with, uh, with king g2, saves his h3 pawn, which means I can save my b7 pawn, okay? So I, take ch I do check, king g3, and I save my b7 pawn, knight f5, and then bishop f4 check. King g4, and now I go king up. And after king here, I said, let's give a pawn on h6. And this was not played, so let's show it. If knight takes, I go king here, knight here, and then rook g2, king f3, rook c2. And then I win the pawn here. So we trade pawns, but then this pawn like unlocks on c3, unlocks my three pawns to be passed and winning. So this was not played. h4 was played instead. I have to play very accurately here. So I played king f6 and on knight takes h6, I have rook check. And I had calculated here that I'm fine as the black pieces. After king h4, I have takes. You cannot take my pawn because I take this knight. Very nicely discovered attack on this knight. So I acknowledged rook f1, which pins my bishop and forces king e5. And after check, king e4 and you take my pawn, white would have won a full pawn here. I, I'm probably winning with like bishop d2 and scooping up this pawn here at once. And overall, this is an easy game to convert because I have a pawn majority on the queen side and this king is on the king side all the way out west. So, but my opponent blundered here, the final blunder of the game, king f3. And after rook g3 check, king moves to f2 or e2, and now I take the pawn, this knight is absolutely hopeless and trapped. When we started the end game off and that knight was coming deep into my position, I said to myself, if I trap this knight, the game is over. And sure enough, 
I found a way to trap the knight. I, I thought I was going to trap the knight when the possibility of taking b7 was open. But no, I trapped the knight when it was here. And here my opponent resigned, giving me 2.5 out of 4. And tomorrow I'm playing a really, really strong player at 2177 from the Netherlands. It's going to be an exciting matchup since I live in the Netherlands now. So that's going to be cool. See you tomorrow. Thank you so much for watching this amazing recap. And overall, Portuguese snack, fire. It's still here, by the way. Mmm!